and uh, also judges just to let you know we'll collect the scoring sheets at the end of the last presentation for the tabulation at the end so we'll take the folders at that point welcome back and let's get started again so for the medical category the finalist is a new treatment approach for spinal cord injury and let me welcome Dr. Joannis Deprick, who will be presenting the idea today. Welcome. Thank you. I had a co-presenter, Dr. Ann Parr. She got, her right got stuck to the airport in a traffic jam accident, so unfortunately she couldn't make it. So you're right about taking the flight before, which she couldn't, couldn't really do this time. So I'm Dr. Johannes Abrich, the CEO of Neuropair. We're developing the first approach to spinal cord injury that protects and guides the body's own tissue to um, help recovery, functional recovery, and provide long, um, avoid long-term injury. Spinal cord injury is a devastating illness with no cure. There are about uh, 700,000 cases worldwide every year, 17,000 cases in the US, and the, the cost for the patient is very high. Most of the two-thirds of the um, accidents, two-thirds of the injuries are caused by accidents or falls, the rest by sports accidents or other causes. When you have an injury, the patient is directed to a trauma hospital that has a sp spinal cord injury specialty. So the trauma neurosurgeons at the hospital would be our first uh, proponents. Uh, for the treatment, um, you have the payers after FDA clinical trial approval. That would be regular medical insurance, Medicare, Veterans Administration. And the biggest component that you can save, the cost is related to hospitalization and rehab. So those, reducing those costs are the benefits to the buyers. The treatment cost is projected at $200,000, which is a credible number based on information from the Reef Foundation, uh, medical device experts, and uh, legal settlements. So just for acute spinal cord injury, uh, the market is about half a billion dollar every year in the US. This would be 14% of the 17,000 patients, so about 2,400. The worldwide market is more like 4.4 billion, that would be 5%, and again, it's only for acute spinal cord injury. There are large additional markets uh, for chronic spinal cord injury, so it's likely we can do this too. Um, peripheral nerve injuries, the market is a little bit bigger, and the veterinary use. Our key innovation is that we can guide neuronal growth with an injectable scaffold that perfectly conforms to any shape of an injury site. Um, it provides a guidance for neurons and it's fast and minimally invasive. So we have uh, an issued patent and several other pending patent applications for the technology. Dr. Parr's technology at the University of Minnesota, her key innovation is that she can accelerate the differentiation of stem cells. So stem cells are a very promising approach for spinal cord injury, but also for other ones. It was just yesterday one where, where they did an eye transplant and they hope to actually regenerate a vision by, by an eye transplant. So she can turn skin cells of a patient into spinal neural stem cells. So this process here, you take a small biopsy, and you differentiate them, amplify them, and then you can inject them into the same person, which means there will be no rejection. If you have other, other stem cells, other patient cells, there could be rejection. So this means they can be co-injected with our injectable scaffold in a combination therapy that would be universal and ready for the patient when the patient is ready for that, for that intervention. So the, the way this works, you have this injury here that could be uh, a complete cut or a crush filled with blood or other fluid. The neurosurgeon would carefully remove something of the blood and then you fill it 
with the combination of the magnetic particles and the spinal neural stem cells. You then apply a magnetic field. This is like, we call this a magnetic mouse. It has magnets on the side. You put it on top of the um, cord and it, within minutes you, you create these magnetically formed fibers. That's exactly the same thing as when you played in elementary school with, with iron filings on a piece of paper and you put a magnet underneath. They follow the, the field lines. This is exactly the same approach, only like 100 times smaller. And I, I was at a conference where people have tried to make injectable scaffolds where they already have fibers aligned. But that doesn't really work because it's like being in here with a 30-foot ladder and you can't really um, turn it in a, in a crowded space. The spinal cord is, is difficult. It's viscous and you can't really arrange it. So I thought, wait a minute. I've worked with magnetic particles for a long time and if you inject the particles, they can actually diffuse and go in any, every little nook and cranny that you have and then you apply the field and you create the fibers. They get cross-linked. Uh, biodegradable DNA from the person. We can use a buckle swab of the person's own DNA. Cross-link the fibers and then after a few minutes, five minutes, you can take the magnet away and the fibers remain like this. This is the device that I just showed. Uh, it's very simple. It has two rows of magnets here with the window in the middle and you would then place it after the stabilization whenever you're ready with the patient to after the injection to align the fibers and create the fibers in the, in the center of it. On the left, you can see a microscopic image, uh, Jason Pokala from Princeton, who's here too. Um, you can see individual neurites from several um, axons, neurons that grow along these fibers. Here, this is an explant, so a part of a spinal cord from a pig roughly the same size of a human. And you can see here, if you have an irregular shaped injury, the, the fibers completely perfectly bind and connect with the outside. And so establishing this molecular contact is really important to have a graft-host interaction. So scaffolds that have been used by now by other companies, they're basically blunt cylinders or something like this. You have to cut the spinal cord and then you put them in and even then it's not a good connection to most of the remaining axons on, on the other end. So with our injectable scaffold, it's not only simpler but it creates much better contact for the neurons then to talk to each other. The limited treatment options today, there's no surgical opportunity you have to stabilize the injury and then wait. Um, of course, the neurotrauma surgeons want to have minimally invasive surgery, surgery and rehabilitation is then the most common treatment. What's common is they say time is spine or less time is more spine. So like in a heart attack or a stroke, you, it, the chances for recovery are greatly improved if you can do it quickly. Competitors. Um, not counting the stem cell approach right now. These implants that I already mentioned, there are compounds. They've been in the news the last couple of years. They're bioactive fibers. They can go uh, enhance the um, growth and electrical stimulation. That was also in the news. Implants have to be inserted. That's, that's a problem. And they take fa uh, fabrication. The other ones, however, they're perfectly compatible with what we're doing. So we can most likely combine these bioactive fibers, electrical stimulation, in, in combination with the stem cells and the scaffold to make it better. No competitor in this field has been able to um, have any success in humans yet. We've raised initial funding, showed that it works in the lab. Um, we're translating it now uh, into 3D. We do animal studies, so we're, we're working with simple uh, rat spinal cord magnets. We also work with Eve Tsai in Ottawa. She works with human spinal cords explants. It's, it's amazing. It can be a shortcut because you get to work with two days of alive tissue defined from a donor that's recently deceased. And you, you get like a glimpse into what works in humans so that you don't 
go a long time into animal experiments and all of a sudden you, you figure out it doesn't work in humans. So on the regulatory side, again, there's three sort of shortcuts, they're not really shortcuts, but they're legitimate ways that make it easier for you. The orphan designation I already mentioned, or maybe I didn't, and then there's a humanitarian device exemption that's a type of pre-market application that speeds up the regulatory process. There's also the breakthrough devices program. There's already one in vivo therapeutics competitor that has been um, entered into the breakthrough devices program. So that also, in, in, in summary, accelerates and reduces the cost of the regulatory process. That's my last slide. Um, people always say for a startup you need the perfect team, the perfect VC, the perfect lawyers and everything, and that, that's not possible. I mean, it's like everybody's a winner. But I've, I've had several startups, and I truly believe that we have a really perfect team right now. So on the right here, this is Ann Parr. Um, she, sorry that she's not here. And this is Eve Tsai, who does the human explants, and has a whole bunch of advisors and people. You could look them up. They're all amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you. You talked about a cross-linking process mm -hmm. within the procedure. What is actually driving that cross-linking? Um, diffusion. So you have magnetic particles and you have DNA. You can also use other ones where the, where the particles directly bind to each other. But in solution, the particles are brought together with a magnetic field and then you have DNA that's short, so if you seem to know about this. So you have streptide encoded beads and biotinylated DNA. And so the length of the DNA then determines how quickly the crosslinker attaches to the already formed fibers. So you have like a two component mix that's on the table there. You inject it, you quickly form the fibers through the magnetic field, and then sort of the the DNA sort of diffuses on and binds and coats it. It's almost like the caterpillar nest that you see in the trees. And then when you take off the magnetic field, um, they're, they're flexible, but they stay connected. Are you incorporating nerve growth factors into the uh, matrix that you're injecting? We haven't done that yet, but that's in the patent and in the plan. So we have worked with bioactive molecules, which is a catch-all term, but there was a paper from uh, Stupp and others from Northwestern University a year and a half ago that make a big splash. So they're, they're very popular right now, and we're working on that with Princeton and, and Minnesota to, to show that in, in animals. Uh, there's been a lot of research suggesting that uh, nerve stimulation or electrical stimulation is critical to uh, get a functioning conduit as opposed to just an anatomical conduit. I Have agree you uh, have been working with that as well? Not yet. <laughs> so I, it's, uh, you're asking the, exactly the right thing. So it, it's known, even if you reconnect, it's, it's sort of understood that about 10% reconnection is enough plasticity for the, for the body to try to make something work. And you're never going to be perfect, but you may regain bladder function and, and maybe even some gait. And so the Curtin papers that came out last year from electrical stimulation, they're amazing papers. So, so rehabilitation and electrical stimulation, once you have some connection, they can really embellish it and make it stronger and, and hopefully in greatly increase the functionality again. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, time is spine. Mm -hmm. So what is the time from injury to repair? How much time do you have? And also you mentioned the stem cells. How long does it take to grow and amplify those stem cells? That's a very good question. The process to make the stem cells right now is about three to four weeks. Initially, we thought we focus on acute spinal cord injury because you have the scar formation, and we thought avoiding the scar 
gives you the ability to create more function. Now, talking with other people, um, Anne Parr, Yves Tsai, Wolfram Tetzlaff, Martin Schwab, they say it's not that critical. So you have a subacute phase. That it starts maybe two to three weeks after the initial injury, and then you have a relatively long phase. It's like when you have a, a wound. It, it remodels itself for months. And so the scar formation is not a dead-end roadblock that we initially thought. So the time would be very compatible with the process to make these stem cells. And finally, what we thought was a difficult propo proposal to use for chronic injury, you probably don't have to do a debridement. So people initially said to you, so the competitors, they have to, they make a fresh cut like on a sausage or a Christmas tree, and then they put in this, this scaffold just to have a raw, but, but that may not be necessary. So it seems we can, we can do acute, maybe subacute and chronic. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you.